Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome Zhu Chen. He is a Senior Director of Power Renewables and Energy Transition at FTI Consulting. Zhu, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, so we're going to talk about solar energy today and uh, with Zhu, because that is his uh, field of expertise. Um, Zhu, I warned you, guests on this podcast introduce themselves. So if you don't mind, uh, imagine you've arrived somewhere, you don't know anyone, and uh, you are. they ask you to introduce yourself and you have about a minute. Please introduce yourself. Oh, absolutely. Uh, great to be here. Um, um, my name is Zhu Chen. I have been with FTI for about one and a half years now coming from a long career within the solar industry for the past 15 years or so, and having worked for multiple original equipment manufacturers, and most of them uh, Chinese firms, in the solar panel, solar inverter, and other type of equipment manufacturing, as well as to the downstream uh, sales, business development, and more importantly, my personal and the core competence in project finance and project development. Here at FTI, I've been more in charge, well, given my background, I've been more, more or less in charge of the solar sector. But I do have my uh, tentacles also exp uh, expanded towards uh, fields like energy storage, electric vehicle, and other renewable energy that's ultimately integral to the entire energy transition for the global ma energy market. Uh, sure. Yeah, great to be here and happy to help out, have, well, have to make a discussion and conversation happen. Sure. Well, as you know, and we, we've discussed before, there's a, a whole lot happening in the solar field now, the solar sector. Uh, the market is booming. There are a lot of projects being developed, but there are also some real obstacles. Um, we talked some weeks or months ago after uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection uh, impounded uh, what, several thousand shipments of solar equipment. Uh, so what's the I understand that that has been alleviated somewhat. But last year, I think it was between uh, uh, June and October, something like a thousand shipments were detained. The, the value of those shipments was hundreds of millions of dollars. Where what is the current situation with solar panel uh, imports from China, in particular with regard to the uh, enforcement of the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act. What's going or, or Prevention Act? What's what's going on there? Mm -hmm. oh, very good, Ed. As you know, the basic Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act (UFLPA) was officially enforced starting in June 2022, but a precursor to that, called the Withholding and Release Order (WRO), was enforced much earlier, back in 2021. So basically, the what they call the uh, uh, impounding of the imports of the solar module and solar products from, from China, and, uh, and more importantly, actually from Chinese firms based in Southeast Asia, have already been a recurring scene for the solar industry since 2021, uh, and to some extent, uh, very significantly disrupting the supply chain into the U.S. market. The, and while starting with 2022, with the U.S. LPA enforcement, I think U.S. Custom Border and Control have been more focused on the kind of leading companies of solar module manufacturers and suppliers in the U.S. And that's usually counted with one hand. Uh, you can count names like Longji Solar, Trina Solar, uh, Jinko, JA Solar, etc., as those were primarily being targeted. And among the basically thousands of incumbent of the shipment, uh, those are the companies um, basically behind the, the basic bit behind the shipping, uh, behind the supply side. Right. Um, so well, if, I could, if I could interrupt there yeah. for just a second, Zhu, because mm -hmm. I know this is complex and there are a lot of different players here. Um, but so there were there were shipments that were being impounded because of discussions about uh, uh, dumping, right? That there were from other countries, right? That there, that other countries were being used as a conduit for Chinese content. But then the more recent actions have been under the UFLPA. Is that? I just want to make sure I'm I'm clear about what you're saying. Uh, actually, no. The the WRO is also linked to Xinjiang. It's actually uh, just a, a lesser version of the UFLPA prior to the enforcement of the full Forced Labor Prevention Act. Okay. So yeah, so this issue has been on the table and in, in the force for more than two years now. It's just that it really kind of culminated with the UFLPA passage that itself is enforcement in 2022. 
Gotcha. So yeah. has mm-hmm. this been alleviated? I've seen news reports now since uh, uh, some of these were Reuters was one of the leading uh, reporting, uh, leading the reporting on this in January about all the shipments that were being impounded. Have those shipments been released now? What are the status of some of those uh, over a thousand shipments that were detained? What's the status mm-hmm. with those now? Well, latest news is that uh, quite a few of those shipments has been released um, as compared to the, in the earlier days of the enforcement where neither CBP or the basic importers know what exactly kind of set of documents and information or data uh, to be submitted submitted for basic clearance at the, at the border. Uh, now, I think the CBP has provided a more uh, kind of more clarified you know, regulations on what kind of documents we would like to see from the shipment to clear basically the UFLPA concerns. And that has led to the supply side to basically make arrangements to obtain those documents and also to arrange the supply chain dedicated towards clearing UFLPA. And that has allowed uh, old shipment detained at the border to be released as well as new shipment, as I understand, becoming a big, a lot big, being able to clear at the CBP much faster and much, um, basically much easier. And you're saying uh, U.S. Uh, Customs and uh, you're saying CBP, that's Customs and Border uh, Border Protection, right? Um, Correct. Just make sure we get every, everyone's on the same page here as the on the acronyms. What percentage of U.S. solar panels today have are, are coming from China? Uh, from China, actually very minimal. Um, as you may recall, as early as 2012, U.S. has already imposed the anti-dumping and countervailing duties on modules of solar cells and modules of Chinese origin. And that was the impetus for the Chinese company to set up manufacturing facilities in Southeast Asia to uh, avoid the ADCDD on Chinese modules and then basically still being able to serve the U.S. market. Um, so okay, so you, so that the anti-dumping rules then led Chinese manufacturers to move to Vietnam, Malaysia. Where were they? Where did they go? Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, and, and to lesser extent Cambodia as well. Those are the four of the main countries. So where is where is well? Let me. So if if the if China is not the main supplier, where where are most U.S. solar panels coming from today? Uh, well, take 2021 as example. I believe. Uh, the 70 percent or i think close to 80 percent of the u.s solar modules are coming from southeast asia basically those four countries uh we mentioned gotcha so Mm -hmm. um and are those chinese companies in those countries then that are own that production then in in those countries that are are china or i'm sorry malaysia uh vietnam uh, thailand and uh, which one would I miss? In, uh, not Indonesia. What was the other? Uh, one? Cam- Cambodia. Yeah. Cambodia. Yeah. So yeah. are those all Chinese companies? Those. So if it's roughly seventy to eighty percent coming from those four countries, what what percentage of that is Chinese ownership? Mostly, mostly. I'll, I'll say close to ninety percent. And it was the exception of uh, Hanwha Q cells, which also have a U.S. based manufacturing and, and of South Korean origin. The others, uh, well, basically all. And most of the leading Chinese comp- solar companies have the operation in Southeast Asia, correspondingly. Gotcha. So I have solar panels on the roof of my house. I have eight and a half kilowatts. Um, uh-huh. They're made by LG. Um, uh-huh. it, would LG have? Um, would these panels have Chinese content, or would is that? Would it? What? It, it's not just necessarily where the panels are made. It's also the polysilicon that's in the panels. And China has a, a dominant position in the production of polysilicon as well. So my question, so is, is there a chance that my Korean made panels have Chinese content? Very likely, very likely. Um, I, think, I think Robert for the LG panel, if you had it in the, in the past few years, it's very likely to be assembled in the US in the LG factory in Alabama, as I recall. But LG, what LG supply chain will do is they actually source the solar cells, most likely from those Southeast Asian countries. Uh, and by which so the solar cells are most likely made by uh, solar wafers. Those are thin slices of silicon wafers from China. And the wafer is most likely uh, at least up to, uh, at least about 90% of the chance is going to be made by polysilicon that's produced in China. Gotcha. Um, and to probably to be more unsettling from the, from the sound of it, um, out of the 90% of the polysilicon, there's half, basically 50% chance it's actually made in Xinjiang region. 
Well, let's talk okay. about Xinjiang because, mm -hmm. um, and I know this is a sensitive subject, and you're uh, you're a U.S. resident, but you we talked about you you hold a Chinese passport. Has the has the reporting on Xinjiang? Uh, I know uh, uh, Laura Murphy uh, out of the U.K. has done reporting on this uh, in 2021. Several agencies, or I think six or seven. Uh, departments of the U.S. government, including the State Department, labeled what's happening in Xinjiang and the Uyghur uh, Muslim population there as uh, genocide. Um, in your view, has this reporting and the U.S. government's reaction to uh, the Uyghur uh, situation in China, has it been fair? Um, I'll, I'll say one thing. I think for, for one part, Xinjiang region has been under a lot of uh, uh, political as well as, well as uh, some terrorism threats over the past two decades. I think the situation on the ground had well, it it was uh, as, at one time basically of the, in the past twenty years also an epicenter of basically of the kind of uh, 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 basically um, I would say religion driven terrorist attack as part of the global Islamic uh, terrorism terrorism. But I think what China, what is basically the government in China did is they had they did enforce a very strong crackdown on such activities and along the way uh, it has brought uh, Xinjiang region to into a much more secure uh, situation as it stands now but along the way it certainly comes from very uh, strict enforcement strict control and a lot of security uh, security measures what uh, what's happening in Xinjiang uh, to a certain extent is uh, probably more more extreme version of what happens everywhere in China. I think there's a lot of a uh, well, given how the government and the governing system is set up in China as versus in the U.S., there are a lot of the things that have been done very differently. <laughs> I think that's something I can say uh, quite frankly. Um, to to say that what is happening to the basically the Uyghur and Muslim population in Xinjiang as genocide will be a quite of an exaggeration, if not outright. Um, yeah, I say, well, if, if not outright, basically unjustified accusations. Mm, yeah, for me, yeah, it's, uh, well, well, growing up in China and seeing what, what had what ha happened in China, what, and also seeing what's uh, currently happening on the ground in China, it is safe to say that uh, basically there are a lot of, uh, uh, certainly a lot of issues a lot of issues with the general population and but there isn't what we haven't really readily observed is the kind of a racial or ethnic uh, discrimination uh, or even to the extent of cleansing that's happening and that's not something we're seeing that's not something we're really hearing from our friends in either in Xinjiang or outside of Xinjiang um, and it's also not something uh, it's not to the extent uh, that what has been reported by most of the Western media. So I, I just want to be clear here, and I understand you're in a, well, I think it's fair to say, a, a somewhat difficult situation and that you're in the U.S. and you want to maintain positive relations with China, but you're saying that in, that these reports of genocide and forced labor in Xinjiang are wrong? Unsubstantiated, that would be my assessment on those reports. Okay. Um, fair enough. Um, I, we might have to differ on that, given the amount of reporting that I've seen, because it uh, there is a lot of reporting on this, and it would be, I mean, I've, n I've not seen the U.S. government come out with this many different agencies saying flat out that this is genocide and there but it's go but the reporting on this is and, and laura murphy from hallam university has put out another report and there's been some other reports about uh the uyghur forced labor not just in solar but in other man other industries right including glass uh textiles um agriculture uh do you, you you say the same that this is not a this this is exaggerated as well Indeed, indeed. Well, well, from my own personal experience, I have been involved with manufacturing companies that have uh, participated in what, what is alleged labor arrangement, uh, basically initiated by uh, either local or kind of, you, basically uh, kind of central government in China. And you do hear reports about basically Uyghur labor forces being transported to other provinces in China to work in factories. And that's actually a very common practice uh, in, in China, not just for Xinjiang, but also for other provinces where they organize surplus labor, uh, kind of do uh, education and training 
and then also basically make arrangements, factory and basically manufacturing powerhouses elsewhere uh, to provide a kind of a labor uh, labor agreement, almost a supply, basically a labor supply agreement type of arrangement to to readily call those labor arrangements. Uh, basically, forced labor would be quite disingenuous because it, it is part of the, uh, I would say, the government as well as well. It's part of the government and society efforts, really, to facilitate the labor movement within China and also to allocate the labor resources to the extent uh, as efficient as possible. That would be my personal experience and personal opinion on those on those programs, those activities. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I I, I want to focus on solar and some of the economics of solar, but I, I, I've also seen a lot of reporting on this that about forced sterilization, um, uh, forced labor uh, at, at large scale um, in Xinjiang. Um, and so uh, that let's but let's set that aside. It's not it's a big issue to just set aside. And I understand you're saying you personally don't understand don't know about this. But let's talk again about what that content then, because is there uh, is there any way for solar panels coming into the U.S.? Because you said that my site, my my Korean panels may have Chinese content um, or, or, you know, some some part of parts of the those panels may have been originated in China. Is there any way to certify and, and to do so reliably uh, that um, the supply chain of the solar sector does not have forced labor content? Well, we actually, at the FTI, we actually get that request from our prospect clients a lot. Um, the honest answer we provide, uh, and it's in all our honesty, is that actually the hot, hot answer will be no. There's no 100% foolproof way to certify across supply chain uh, on forced labor, and especially with anything related to Xinjiang right now. Uh, and that's... Uh, that's a different by two primary factors. One, that being that basically the solar supply chain is quite dispersed and the way that the UFLPA is being enforced, chasing the supply chain all the way up to the silica sand that's going into the polysilicon, make it uh, very difficult to certify the basically this origin of the sand. You can very, it's, it's closer to impossible really to certify each grain of the sand that's going into the melter for making the silicons um, and that's uh, that's what had, that has been the challenge of being faced by the supplier side to re respond to cbp on the uflpa enforcement um, and then secondly i think the chinese government does enforce the uh, a law called anti-sanction law in china that is making uh, kind of specific certification program like for UFLPA close to impossible within Chinese border for for companies like ourselves. So from that standpoint, we have been uh, from FDI side, we actually have been staying away from such requests and such engagement, uh, fully understanding that we cannot truly pro provide a, a kind of one hundred percent satisfactory result for the clients. So if I can just. Uh, so if I can yeah. just read that back to you, Zhu, what I'm saying, what I heard you say is that the Chinese government's own actions have uh, are helping obs or are obscuring then or preventing uh, 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 reliable tracing of supply chains then within China. Is that is that a fair way to read back what you just said? It's part of it. I think the, the dominant force is really the in my opinion, in my personal opinion, is actually the sheer difficulty to go out to be a very dispersed supply chain, especially on the upper stream. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about those upstream issues and I want to, mm -hmm. I want to talk about reshoring because this is another big issue, particularly on production of polysilicon, which mm -hmm. is a very labor or very energy intensive process. Yeah. Um, but there, the, the latest issues in the solar issue, solar sector, aside from the UFLPA and impoundments and shipments are the prices. And the latest reports show that the power purchase agreements for solar in the first quarter rose sharply. They went up eight and a half percent in the first quarter of 2023. Why are prices going up so quickly? They went up faster than they did for wind. Wind was up almost 5%, 4.9%, according to level 10. So why are solar PPAs going up? Everyone's been claiming solar is cheaper. What's what's going on now with these dramatic price increases? Oh, that's actually a very, very great question. Uh, from my perspective, say, I mean, first of all, 
every energy prices, every, every kind of energy cost is increasing. And the general inflation environment is basically providing the supporting environment for solar and other renewable energy to raise PPAs regardless. Uh, and it's supported by also the surge of demand and that's probably more efficiency in Europe and then and, and, and certainly also for the US market. Um, and secondly, the Yep, I think the, the difference between wind and solar and other renewable energy is that, um, and as, as you exactly pointed out, the, the U.S. is fairly dependent on basically imports of solar products across the value chain. Um, the way that the, how the tariff work and, and talk about the last year is about the, basically the new initiative, initiative for anti-circumvention of the ADCBD. On Chinese tariffs, but targeting the Southeast Asia. I'm sorry, you, you gave this an acronym there. I have to interrupt you. So, uh, circumvention of of anti uh, anti, anti dumping anti counterfeiting duties. Okay, and so yep. what was that? Mm -hmm. uh, AD <laughs> counterfeiting duty. ADCD. ADCBD. Okay, right. So yep. I, I I hadn't heard <laughs> that acronym that. before. So you're <laughs> saying there the part of this I'm just reading back. I want you to continue, but I hadn't heard that acronym before. So you're saying that some of the price increases are due to this having to be more compliant with regulations regarding anti-dumping. Is that am I reading that back correctly to you? Indeed, indeed. That's part of the kind of overall uh, targeted efforts towards the Southeast Asian supplies of solar. Uh, given the given that they, they usually rely on Chinese inputs, Chinese materials for manufacturing the solar modules, there is this current in, uh, investigation at Department of Commerce to uh, assess whether those suppliers are circumventing the basically the anti-dumping duties on Chinese products, on Chinese solar products. Um, and the preliminary findings are actually positive, meaning that yes, there is anti-dumping. So the anti-dumping tariff would likely be applicable for the products coming from Southeast Asia as well. Um, on so top of that, so, so to yeah. interrupt again, I'm sorry. So you, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just want to make sure I'm understand what you're saying is that the preliminary investigations are showing that the Chinese companies are dumping solar panels into the U.S. market by circumventing the the the, the rules and going through uh, uh, the 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 South, Southeast Asian countries. Is that what you've said? Correct. That's the conclusion of the Department of Commerce investigation in the preliminary conclusion. And when did that come out? Uh, that came out in December 2022. Okay, so I wasn't, yep. I didn't see that. But mm -hmm. so that, so in other words, to again to read this back to you, uh, Zhu, because I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying, is that one of the reasons why solar prices are going up is that solar imports of solar panels are being hit with tariffs because. Uh, of of the domestic manufacturers are are in, want the Department of Commerce to enforce anti dumping mm -hmm. rules. Is, am I if I have I captured this correctly? That is correct. But okay. with the with the added complexity that back in June 2022, the Biden uh, Joe Biden actually enforced a two year moratorium on additional tariff on solar. So even though the Department of Commerce have this preliminary ruling on basically supporting the and basically the kind of circumvention or basically supporting imposing those tariffs on Southeast Asia, that is a two year window that they cannot do so uh, basically until June 2024. So the Biden administration has yeah. given a reprieve then a special carve out, if I could put it that way, mm -hmm. to the solar industry from these uh, from these tariffs. Indeed, indeed. But the mere possibility of having this tariff especially in the first half of uh, 2022, essentially stopped a lot of shipment from Southeast Asia to the US. Um, and that created basically the supply crunch in the earlier, earlier time in 2022 that basically raised the price of solar panels in the US dramatically. Yeah, the, I think 2022 has seen great inflation, inflationary pressure on a lot of products, solar as well. I think uh, in general, on the global level, solar panel price basically went back to the 2019 price level in 2022. So that it, so even though we always forecast solar price to go down continuously with all the technological and the supply improvement, uh, 2022 uh, actually 2021, 2022 were, were the exceptions. The price went up or basically kind of plateaued from that standpoint. And so, it's, yeah, 
Go ahead. So, so, the, so then the PPAs, and I've, I've reported on this, utility products in general, uh, copper wire, poles, uh, you know, uh, the regular kind of transformers, so a lot of the basic material, basic commodities and, and equipment that's required to install solar and wind across the board, there's been huge inflation in all of those commodities, 18% last year, uh, according to the Rural Electric Supply Cooperative, which I wrote about on my Substack, uh, uh, Untransformed, a piece I published mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. I made this, this well, I just reported on it, right? So some of these PPAs then for the cost for solar and new PPAs is up 8% uh, in the first quarter. Some of that is being driven by uh, cost increases that have nothing to do with the panels themselves. Is that, mm -hmm. am, I, am I hearing you correctly? Indeed, indeed. Yeah. But for solar panels more prominently, and I think with couple coupled with the general inflation, the tariff scare, and, and then in the second half of 2022, the ULPLPA enforcement, there has been a, a dramatic dislocation of supply and demand of solar panels in the US. And that has raised the price, raised the cost for solar panels. More, much more so compared to the general inflation. Uh -huh. So the yeah. uncertainty mm -hmm. is is one of the, the price the, is affecting the price, right? The uncertainty right. leading to uh, some shortages of supply, those are those are contributing to the inflation. That is correct. Okay. Um, so are we are you seeing then a, a significant reshoring? Of, because I, I want to read there was a uh, you used to work at GCL, if I recall, or from mm -hmm. GCL Technology yeah. Holdings, right? So you're familiar with right. this company. There was a recent uh, a news article, uh, and GCL is a, is a big uh, producer of polysilicon, as I understand it. Um, and I'm reading, I think this was a Reuters story that um, said GCL is looking to expand outside the, of China. And here I'm reading from the piece. It says, however, the company said it, is un it will likely pass on the United States for new polysilicon production due to high costs, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, the G uh, GCL's chief executive, uh, Lan Xian uh, uh, Shi, uh, said the Inflation Reduction Act uh, helps make the U.S. market more appealing, but it's still five times more expensive to produce polysilicon in the U.S. than in China. Uh, poly U.S. policies are attractive, but not attractive enough. Uh, Tian Shi said, is, is, it, is that true that it's uh, to produce polysilicon in the U.S. costs five times what it costs in China? Well, it's certainly one of the factors deterring companies like GCL to set up polysilicon manufacturing here. The, the five times uh, cost actually refer more to the capital expenditure. And the, basically the sheer civil and kind of basic equipment construction needed to set up basically the polysilicon plant will be quite high, uh, quite higher than if you do it in China or in Southeast Asia. And this actually is a, a kind of across the board, across the kind of solar value chain. We actually have a, a little kind of cheat sheet numbers saying that for, for example, for solar module and solar cell uh, that manufacturing facilities, uh, including everything right, that's construct basically land, building, facilities, labor, uh, and other and per uh, permitting activities, the, a factory in the U.S. will probably cost three to four times X of those in Southeast Asia and very likely to be close to five X in China. And that's, that applies to uh, polysilicon manufacturers as well. It's not necessarily just the operating cost. I think from an operation standpoint, as you correctly pointed out, polysilicon manufacturing is basically energy intensive. It's not really very labor intensive. The labor really occupies a very small portion of the total operating cost and all the costs of the polysilicon. But the U.S. actually enjoys a certain type of energy cost advantage over China, but it's really the initial capex now and now have to express as a depreciation over the years that's being kind of prohibitively expensive for companies like GCL. Okay, so uh, I'm going to repeat back what you what I what I heard you say. Then, if the capital costs of trying of trying to to manufacture solar panels in the U.S. is three to five x what it is in Southeast Asia and China, uh, is it fair to say we're not going to see much uptick in solar manufacturing in the U.S. Or if we do, it's going to mean significantly higher solar panel prices to end users. Oh, that's uh, that's not a wrong prognosis for uh, all the prospects for the U.S. market, but we have seen uh, quite a re kind of a surge in the kind of reshoring, or at least basically a new capacity expansion on at least the solar module manufacturing part. 
And what's underlying that surge is really the IRF Inflation Reduction Act incentives, uh, expressed for module as uh, basically seven cents per watt, uh, almost direct subsidy to manufacturers to basically making those panels here in the U.S. Um, yeah, I want to hear. So you said yeah. seven cents per watt is what would be the subsidy under the Inflation Reduction Act. That's correct. Yeah. And so, how, what does that translate? So, but that even with that seven cents per watt, uh, so that would be uh, well seven dollars then per kilowatt, right? So, if my numbers uh, are right, seventy dollars per kilowatt. Seventy dollars per kilowatt. Yep. Forgive me. Mm -hmm. um, then, is, will that make then module manufacturing competitive here in the U.S. Then, or not? Uh, I think it will actually. Now, consider this for a module coming from China or from Southeast Asia without any tariff and actually including shipping, it will be anywhere between, uh, I would say, 25 cents and 30 cents per watt now for the US market. Uh, Seven cents is a very significant portion of percentage of those costs. And if you, have, if you do have to import all the, uh, for example, solar cells and what people call the bill of materials, equipment and uh, components from overseas to the U.S. to assemble them into the U.S. You may be looking at, uh, and, and also factor in the tariffs that will be applicable. That will be anywhere between 15%. And for Chinese product, it could be up to 200%. Then the seven cents incentives more than, more than able to cover the kind of added cost for manufacturing in the U.S. And, and for that exact reason, we're seeing uh, leading companies like uh, Longji Solar, Trina Solar, and uh, Jinko and JA Solar all announcing new new build, new factory or new capacity expansion in the U.S., but exclusively on the solar module side, because they know they can take advantage of the seven cents incentive and still being able to price the products competitively within the U.S. But that being said, uh, going back to your the kind of original message in your, in your question, I, I think it will be a fair statement to say the U.S. market will continue to see higher solar module costs, higher solar module price as compared to the rest of the world, especially in China and to certain extent in, in Europe as well. And that's because of the imposition of the tariffs, the relatively kind of isolated status of this market and all the incentives going in is not being able to really bring those incentives are going to the manufacturers, uh, most likely, but not that directly to the consumers, and most likely as well. I see. So yep. um, then, again, what I think I'm hearing you say is the U.S. We're going to, uh, U.S. consumers, U.S. solar uh, installers are going to have to compete in the global market where the Europeans obviously are wanting to build more solar. So the, and, but if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that the combination of the, the U.S. tariffs with the UFLPA, um, it, despite the Inflation Reduction Act may not result, well, it will result in some more solar manufacturing occurring here in the U.S., but it's going to long-term, what I believe you just said was, Long, you're you're saying that over the longer term, solar prices are going. The panel prices themselves are going to are going to rise because of all these factors. Is that is that is that fair? Well, I would say the solar panel price will continue to drop to uh, basically uh, uh, to be reduced in a continuous fashion uh, in concurrence with the global trend. But but my expectation is there will always be a premium or spread between U.S. price versus the global price. And that, that little premium and spread is ultimately driven by the tariffs and the other trade restrictions that made the U.S. market, uh, from a global standpoint, rather isolated. Huh, that's interesting. I hadn't <laughs> thought about that. But as you're saying this, I'm thinking, well, there are similar price disparities between, say, natural gas at TTF in Europe, right? There's a trading hub in, in Holland called TTF versus the U.S. trading hub for gas is Henry Hub. And there's a big difference in our spread between those two basins, right? So you're saying there'll be a similar spread, a similar differential uh, for solar prices in Europe versus the U.S., um, but what about the labor part of that? You know, one of the other things that's uh, and, and people who 
track solar prices, they say, okay, well, yeah, the panels, the price of the panels are going down. And we've touched on this a little bit, right? But it's not just the price of the panels that ultimately matter to the end consumer or the end installer. It's the balance of system. So mm -hmm. tra transformers, uh, uh, interconnection uh, to high voltage systems. Uh, uh, have you tracked that? Are you familiar with what's happening with those balance of system costs? We've we have mentioned, uh, obviously, copper, copper wire, you know, uh, transformers, pad mounted transformers, all these things are uh, pole mounted transformers, all these things are going up in price. Is that also going to be a, a significant factor in the price of solar as uh, it expands over the next few years? Yep, uh, absolutely. I think those balance of plans, uh, to a certain extent, to, to a large extent, will be applicable for most uh, other type of energy storage, uh, sorry, energy projects as well. So wind, uh, energy storage, et cetera. And that applies to the basically supporting structures, which are basically steel or other other metal. Uh, and, and then things like uh, the, basically the transformers and inverters, which are power electronics. Um, there will be, uh, yes, I think similar to solar panel, for example, transformers. I think there are certain, there are similar restrictions out of a national security ground uh, that against basic products coming from China and actually basically outside of the US. And that actually has created this basically very acute shortage of transformers in the US uh, that basically really wreaking havoc on, uh, on the grid operations across the nation. Um, and those, well, that, well, and if yeah. I can jump in, because, yeah, wreaking havoc. I think that's a that's a, a pretty accurate statement. I mean, and this goes back not just to the labor of assembling the transformers, but also grain oriented steel. Right, it's a, mm -hmm. a key commodity inside the transformers. The supplies of that are very constrained. Uh, imports on that commodity are, are subject to tariffs. So there are a number of factors that are combining here that are create that are contributing, as we've discussed, to an inflation. But let me shift a little bit, Zhu, if you don't mind. And again, a quick station break. My guest is Zhu Chen. He is a senior director for power renewables and energy transition at FTI Consulting. He's had a long career in the solar industry. Um, are the efficiency levels on panels peaking? I mean, have we gotten to the level where the efficiency, you know, everything gets to a peak where it can't, the bets limit in wind energy, right? There's a, there's a physical limit on how much energy you can harness from the wind due to fluid mechanics and so on. It, are, are we seeing an, a, a peaking or near peak in the efficiency of solar panels? Well, it's a. Uh, it depends on the basically the how you how you look at at what scale you're looking at basically solar technology. Um, well, when I entered the solar industry back in 2008 2009, the typical solar cell was it basically is basically producing at the efficiency of around 15 16 percent, with the solar modules at more more or less 14 to 15 percent range. Now that range has been uh, in, in terms of mainstream products currently in the market so the solar cell is actually 21 to 22 percent with the modules being basically above 20 percent um, if you uh, look at the figure what, what happened over the past 10 years the sheer improvement in efficiency from the technology standpoint is awesome. basically is actually astonishing um i actually anticipate this trend um uh, well well, from 15 to 20 is a, well, sorry, from 15 to 22 is a very big jump. But I think what we, what we have in the next 10 years, that we'll still continue, we'll continue to see the improvement efficiency, but probably not at the rate as the kind of the sheer range that we have observed in the past 10 years. And that's mostly uh, basically governed by the basically law of physics and how basically the photovoltaic effect can take effect on those on the basically silicon-based semiconductors, um, and and also speak of the basically general uh, of uh, manufacturing and kind of process engineering process that basically allow those solar cells and modules being manufactured. But that being said, we are currently at the junction of uh, basically a scaling up of the next generation silicon-based solar cells called the Topcon. Um, full name tunnel oxide conduct uh, conductive uh, I need to work on my knowledge of that, but it's got T O P C O N Topcom is the new basically generation of technology that being currently scaled up and probably will be making up the majority of shipment starting in 2024. 
um, that's uh, basically uh, uh, quite a bit, that it's more or less a 10% efficient jump from the current mainstream market product we're receiving on the solar cell or the module side. And then, then this top kind technology expected to take us to a continuous incremental improvement over the next five or even 10 years. And, and then basically in the near future, there's another competing technologies that are being currently being mature, matured and being improved upon for mass manufacturing. And that's called the heterojunction uh, tendon cell, HJT in short. And those are basically another generation of solar cell that will probably provide an additional 0.5% efficiency as compared to top gun. So overall speaking, over the next 10 years, we may see solar cell efficiency going up from the current 22% all the way up to, to close to 26 or even 27%. And that's uh, still a very significant improvement. Sure. That's a big jump. And if you don't mind, give me that acronym for the next generation. You said T-O-P? Uh, T-O-P-C-O-N. C-O-F as in Frank. C-O-C-O-N as in Nancy. C-O-N, top con. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, because I would just thought I'd, I'd look it up. I'd hit the Google here very quickly. Okay, top con solar cell. Uh, cell uh, passivated by aluminum oxide, fine layer on the surface of a P-type material. I uh, fine layer, very, uh, two, two nanometer silicon dioxide tunneling layer and highly polysilicon thin film below the SiO2 layer. So uh, two nanometers, that is getting a very... Uh, uh, that's two billionths of a meter, right? Um, Indeed. <laughs> so, the, but your your point about the, the limits on physics, that's the similar then in the, the, the mechanics of building the solar wafers are, are getting very similar to the, as I'm reading this, to what we think about in, in semiconductors, right? We're reaching the limits of physics and in, in the ability to make those, you know, nanometer scale etchings on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, semiconductors, we're seeing the same thing in solar. Is that the same limit then? Indeed, indeed. I would say so. I think silicon materials as the uh, kind, of, kind of photovoltaic material has, it has its natural and physical limitation given the basically electron band gap. Uh, it, it tells it has to, it will, the, the, there is a physical limit on the efficiency of uh, silicon based solar cells. And that may be in the 30% range. If we're going from, you're saying 20%, 22% now, we could get to 26, but maybe 30% is going to be the maximum, something like that. Or is that, or is that it, it fair to even estimate? I mean, we always underestimate the ability of the systems to increase efficiency and so on. But um, is 30%, is that, is, would that be a natural assumption that we can't get much more than that? I'll, I'll say so, yeah. That's actually, it sounds like the right range. Um, I have to look at that from my science books, but yep, thirty percent is most likely going to be a kind of a real upper limit for silicon-based technology. Um, I think that's why exactly uh, basically so in, within the solar industry, there are also technology looking beyond silicon and looking at the new materials that can bring in a higher promise of a either lower, much lower cost or basically higher efficiency. Uh, one of the contending technology, uh, which has been in existence for decades already, is called perovskite, uh, oh, right. P-E-R-O-E-S-K-Y. -E and that's another type of the solar cells being currently uh, under very intensive R&D activities, looking to be the kind of real next generation disruptor for the solar products as well. Right. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. heard of the perov perovskite, the, the, that that. Uh that technology. Um, so what about interconnections? I, I've written a lot about, continue to write a lot about land use conflicts and that this being one of the key constraints for solar. And I was in Michigan a few weeks ago, met with a local group of, of landowners who are fighting solar, big solar projects in their, in their neighborhoods. But that's only one part, right? As my friend Lee Cordner says, where are you going to put it? How are you going to connect it? And how are you going to pay for it? So mm -hmm. we ignore where are you going to put it and how you pay for it. What about the interconnections? Is there, 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 the system, the network in the United States, the grid, the electric grid we have is constrained by the high voltage transmission network. Are you following this? The interconnection queues, particularly in California, there are long interconnection queues for projects of all kinds, in, but in particular batteries and solar. Um, have you looked at that? Can you talk about that in, in uh, both or either in California or in the U.S.? Uh, certainly. Uh, on the surface, it's not my necessarily my forte, but I did have my years in project development. 
so I followed the intersection topic uh, for a little while. Uh, my understanding is that, well, for, I would say for the good part, California is not, not is now not alone in the interconnection struggle for solar and other renewables. Um, basically, other grid like PJM and Texas are facing even to certain extent even graver kind of interconnection challenge compared to California with the sheer amount of the solar project and battery storage projects looking to interconnect. Um, and that's uh, that's a problem. Very well, that's a very real physical problem. Your grid can only handle basically so much interconnection, so much resources coming online. And that's really determined by the wires and the poles and basically the uh, physical arrangement of the grid. Uh, and there's no real way to circumvent that uh, in, a, in a very immediate short term. What solar industry or what solar project and what has been doing and together with uh, other renewable energy is basically with the emergence of uh, energy storage becoming a kind of more technological viable as well as economical option. Pairing solar with energy storage is make is probably going to make interconnection a bit easier, requiring less uh, kind of lengthy and expensive interconnection upgrade, and then also being able to allow the grid operators to allocate. Uh, interconnection resources more efficiently. And that's the hope we are hoping to appear for the general project side for solar and renewable energy to, uh, to enable the benefit of energy storage to become that kind of a uh, network grid, ne network upgrade alternatives. Um, so instead of a wire, use energy storage to accommodate the new interconnected resources. So yeah. explain that to me. Why why would the addition of batteries then <clears throat> reduce the need for access to high voltage transmission? Well, uh, from the capacity standpoint, uh, if you do interconnect a 200, for example, a 500 megawatt solar project, if the interconnected line can only take 300 megawatt at the peak capacity, then you are seeing constraints in terms of how you get the 500 megawatt solar out to your Bigger, to the to the grid and to the wider kind of grid operation. Um, well, so instead of uh, putting in uh, kind of 500 megawatt solar directly, uh, which will could probably be curtailed at a 300 megawatt, so you at peak hours you could lose 200 megawatt of your capacity. Uh, adding energy storage to absorb that additional 200 megawatt being produced during those peak hours, and and then basically discharge them at the at the time that the solar is not producing above the line's capacity, then you have a much smoother production line, production yield from the solar plus storage system, and also allow the grid, allow the basically the specific line to transmit those energy pretty much close to 100% without any curtailment. And that's the benefit that, or the value proposition that energy storage is really coming in right now for the renewable energy side. So the batteries then act as a buffer. I'm, I'm use that word between the between the production and the network. Then that you, indeed. Okay. Indeed. Um, and what are you seeing in terms of? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about solar and storage. A lot of talk about batteries. Um, what about the constraints there? I mean, we've talked about. Um, you know, we we talked about the the, the Uyghur issue and and forced labor there. But what about the other issues around batteries and, about, and around copper and lithium and supply chain issues there? These are the other things that are top of mind for a lot of people. And I've had guests on the podcast talking about those issues. What Can you discuss that a little bit, how you see those markets unfolding? Because these projects, whether they're solar, whether they're batteries, uh, you know, or wind projects, they're very resource intensive, land, land intensive, mm -hmm. copper intensive, lithium, uh, manganese, nickel, all of these other things. Uh, are you following those markets at all? Because these are key commodities that are going to be needed in enormous mm -hmm. quantities. I do, I do. Uh, but to also to put it in perspective, so as related to battery, which can be used for uh, electric vehicle, electric tools, as well as energy storage systems, the energy storage system is actually a relatively small portion of the demand for battery and, and basically tracing up for demand for all those critical minerals. So in a, in my head, I think the split is close to 90% for the electric vehicle, 10% for energy storage. So the current surge of demand for those critical minerals and, and also the batteries themselves 
are really driven by the surge in demand for electric vehicle, uh, a little much less so by the demand for energy storage. So for energy storage, it's uh, it has become a price taker for lithium, for copper, and for other critical minerals, as as versus electric vehicle industry, which has been the kind of dominant demand and by correspondingly the to a certain extent also the price setter in the market. Um, what is happening for the energy storage side is that they are, I think, first of all, for energy storage, the, the chemistry going into the battery, the dominant technology of the battery, and now basically converging towards the, uh, basically what we call the LFP, uh, basically lithium ion um, batteries that requires lithium, but doesn't really require other very expensive uh, minerals like nickel, cobalt, or manganese. And that uh, sorry, has, sorry to interrupt you, use, use you know, the acronym LFP that we're talking about lithium iron phosphate batteries, that, right? So that's so correct. No, no yeah. cobalt, no, no, no cobalt is involved in those in the production of those batteries. Cobalt is generally used for batteries that ha need higher energy density, right? That, uh, that's that, correct. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and and EVs being the, the obvious one there. But anyway, I want to make mm -hmm. sure everyone's coming along with your, your <laughs> you use a lot of acronyms you so I want to keep keep our audience up to date. So LFP oh, that's batteries, good practice. Yeah. LFP batteries are the ones that you think are going to dominate then in storage. And they already do. They already do. I think okay. in terms of uh, uh, companies like Tesla, uh, Fluence and all those other companies, they are basically the system that they deploy that now are pretty much 100% uh, basically LFP uh, technologies. Um, and then going forward with, uh, with the basically general price pressure, the inflationary pressure on lithium price and other critical minerals, there are technological breakthroughs that go beyond the lithium chemistry. And one of the probably more, I would say promising contender will probably be the sodium based chemistry that doesn't, doesn't need lithium, but to some extent would be as cheap or even cheaper than uh, LFP uh, chemistry. And those will be, those would typically be coming with less energy, uh, in uh, based energy density compared to even LRP. But for energy storage application, the energy density is not necessarily the first order of consideration. And those could be very well you know, cheaper and more efficient use of the resources for supplying for energy storage applications. And we, I think within the next five years, we will see a quite a bit a nice split of the uh, LFP and the sodium batteries and maybe other type of uh, energy storage as well. So we've talked yeah. only about solar photovoltaic. Is solar thermal dead? Pretty much so. <laughs> I think it's dead in the U.S. Uh, if you have been following the news, the all pretty much all the solar thermal power plants in the U.S. Uh, uh, in the past, mostly funded by the DOE loan guarantee back in the days, uh, all in trouble and probably interim restructuring with DOE. And then the plan, the only limited amount of a global plant operational now are in Spain and in Northern Africa. And there hasn't been talk of any new capacity uh, anywhere really uh, at a significant level. Uh, so yeah, we were not really seeing solar thermal being a very viable or competitive technology going forward. Ivan Pa was one of the last, I guess, or one of the few built in the U.S., right? And so, Indeed. Um, yeah. um, is is solar is solar electricity and the additions of solar electricity? You live in California. Is it good for consumers? I would say it is. It is, especially now that well, I think with the previous generations of a net energy metering policies, the uh, what we call NEM, uh, NEM one and two, which basically allows the solar uh, generation on your rooftop to be compensated for the retail price that you otherwise have to pay to the utilities make solar very attractive and uh well get uh even with the kind of higher kind of capital expenditure up front i think most of the solar customers are really happy in terms of a reduced tariff and the general economic benefit uh, and as you may follow california recently implemented a new at basically and net energy metering policies. Uh, so any new solar exploitation and basically those surplus generation will be only be compensated by, uh, it's like the avoided cost, which was very close to the wholesale market price in Kaiso region. Now the, that's probably be closer to at least, uh, 
I'll say 50 to anywhere between 50 to 80% discounts to what you otherwise will pay on the retail level. So the solar, res especially the residential solar in California, the, the value proposition is fairly impaired under the new policies, but it also gives a new value proposition to energy storage system. So what we're seeing now that for the full California market and probably a nationwide pretty soon, the solar plus storage residential solution being a very, uh, being the emergent and also the dominant market going forward. And the benefit of which is uh, basically saving, saving electricity bill and also serve as the kind of backup power for your entire house. And that to combine is a very powerful message for consumers everywhere. And especially for California as well, that has been stricken by so many accidents and basically natural disasters over the past few years, having a reliable and kind of a controlled cost, kind of cost of electricity is a really nice thing to have. So, well, let me just push back here a little bit. You've given me the case for homeowners, but for people who don't own their homes, are they subsidizing the people that have solar on their roofs? Oh, well, that's why the, where the community solar come into play. I think that's where basically policymakers are making the rec well, recognizing essentially the kind of cross subsidy uh, and dilemma imposed by, imposed by the solar installations. And then with the community solar, installation, which is basically kind of a almost utility level ground on solar project, but allowing a uh, quote unquote subscription uh, at a small portion to end customers. And those will be something that uh, basically will be readily being enjoyed by renters uh, and, and hopefully with a reduced kind of a bill, uh, with the kind of a bill saving and economic benefits as well. So what's your outlook then for solar? Do you think this bullish market is going to continue because of the IRA or what are what are going to be the market drivers and market pulls? Mm -hmm. It will be continued to be a very significant portion of the new capacity and a certain going to be a very significant part of the energy transition away from fossil fuels. Um, and we hope that, that basically with solar, with wind and other renewable energy and coupled with energy storage, it will become a less of intermittent resources, which has been a hazard for the grid operation and becoming more and more uh, uh, from the co both the cost and operation standpoint, a base load type of application for the entire grid. And that's something that um, I think from the solar supply side is trying to get the cost down and get, get the uh, kind of overall cost benefit uh, benefits um, to the optimal level to enable this. And then from the policy side, the rest, uh, policy side to create the kind of enabling environment to promote uh, application of those markets. Mm. Uh, do you have solar on your, you're in, you live in California in the Bay Area, yep. you said, do you have mm -hmm. solar on the roof of your house? I do, I do. I have had it for five years now. And do you pay, a, do you pay an electric bill? I still do <laughs> because of the kind of fixed charges and uh, because of the mismatch between the generation and the consumption pattern. But I think one thing nice I have is that we do, I, I do also own the electric vehicle. So that's a nice compensation, a nice kind of a, a I would say, uh, it's a compatible uh, generation of usage in a way that um, because of the use of the electric vehicle, my general electric consumption will be rather higher than a normal. A residential a residence, but with the solar installation up on the roof, it's really being a, kind of a dedicated resources towards this usage. And how many kilowatts is your system? Uh, I have a little three kilowatt thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and who's your utility? Who who serves your house? Uh, PG and E. So why, why, uh, so uh, <laughs> California utilities are are raising rates across the board. Why are rates going up so dramatically in California? Uh, very good question. I think it's really come down to the reliability of the grid. Um, it's not really the generation side that's creating trouble for the electricity bill on the residential side. I think from the wholesale market standpoint, with the, with the penetration of solar, wind, and other renewables, the marginal cost of the electricity is going down. And I think that's just the nature of the market and the, basically the physical nature of those energy resources. But those intermittent resources does increase the kind of general burden of operating the grid efficiently and, and, and reliably. And that 
has le- basically led to expensive upgrades and sometimes um, not unfulfilled upgrade and that led to basically accidents or basically industrial grade uh, incidents that impact the general supply, electricity supply here in California. Um, not to mention the wildfire and all those added costs that utilities at PG&E and others in California have to be shoulder. And that has been this kind of a general transmission and distribution network level of maintenance and kind of additional costs has been spread to the residential side, uh, to the general ratepayer side, and that has been, been a main driver behind the increase of utility bill, in my opinion. Well, you, you <laughs> make a good case for it, and it sure rhymes. It sure rhymes with what I know that you add more re- intermittent renewables, which, in theory, as you said, the marginal cost is low, but the reliability costs go are high. So, mm-hmm. and who ends up paying for that? The consumer, which. Uh, is one of my criticisms of this, you know, surge toward renewables. It has not, Mm -hmm. or as Meredith Engwin said, you know, the reliability issue has been pushed to the side, but ultimately consumers are going to have to pay one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but that's a, that's maybe a a, a decision or a discussion that we, uh, we don't have time for today. We've been talking now for about an hour. Again, my guest is Yu Chen. He is a senior director of power renewables energy transition at FTI Consulting. He's had a long career. Uh, well, I guess it would be, what, 15-year career now in the solar business? Correct. Um, so I, I always ask my guests, uh, Zhu, I didn't warn you about this. Uh, what are you reading? Mm-hmm. What books are on your shelf? I know you have three young kids, so I'm assuming you're reading some Dr. Mm-hmm. Seuss and some other books uh, to your kids. But uh, what are, any, are you read novels? What uh, science books? What do you read when you're not working? Well, in addition to the children's book, I try to kind of really regroup my sanity to uh, kind of study the new industries that I previously haven't been able to get more involved with. So really the electric vehicle and energy storage actually more upstream, the lithium ion battery industry is somewhere I'm very familiar with. So I'm reading a book that a friend uh, sent me called Bolt, Bolt Rush, B-O-L-T-R-U-S-H. Is it really about the kind of earlier days of history about um, how basically lithium extraction, the lithium mining industry, and how that got catapulted by the lithium ion battery demand and the general kind of electric vehicle and energy storage market? A fascinating book and involving a lot of global and also a lot of the Chinese companies, which is like some even very tasty and saucy uh, kind of a t- uh, <laughs> well, stories and uh, basically rumors around those kind of very colorful characters. So a uh, highly recommendable book. So Volt Rush, now and it's yep. Gold Rush, a Volt Rush. That's right. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, that's a good recommendation. I haven't heard of that book. Um, so the last question I ask this of all my guests is you. Um, there are a lot of challenges in the world, and it's not just in, uh, you know, the the U.S. and China are not on the best terms. The U.S. and Russia are not on the best terms. We have a lot of geopolitical challenges, uh, electric rates going up. There are things that we can be uh, depressed about or pessimistic about. What gives you hope? Well, the general kind of uh, human, humanity is a shared goal of, uh, first of all, remain existent uh, to survive and to uh, basically go through the, basically to overcome challenges that will basically uh, have the existen- existential threat of our human race. And I mean, for us, the uh, constraint of resources, the general goal of uh, basically climate change is showing signs of a real impact on uh, basically a normal uh, person's life and take a lesson from uh, from me living in, in the Bay Area for more than 14 years and seeing how the weather pattern has shifted so dramatically and creating basically kind of disasters that we have never experienced before. Uh, we can, I think I can very safely say that, yeah, global warming or climate change is indeed in motion and it could have catastrophic effects on all of us across the globe. And that, and that issue should transcend any geopolitical conflict or basically national interest conflict. Um, and as someone that has worked in the solar industry and worked in the renewable energy for long term, and uh, it is my sincere hope and also sincere, uh, expectation that basically uh, for folks like myself, either on the science side or on the kind of supply side or on the downstream side, this share the goal of making the energy transition to a clean energy and a cleaner future happen. And that, that is something that, and that 
kind of a shared goal and really removes any uh, barriers from the kind of, as you mentioned, the geopolitical issues and uh, allow us to be continue to be mingled together, share ideas, then basically pursue the goal together. And that, and that is something I like about the renewable energy industry. And certainly that's something I'm still very passionate about and very hopeful about for the future. Well, that's a good place okay. to stop right there then. Uh, my guest has been Zhu Chen. He's uh, at FTI Consulting. You can find out more about him uh, on fticonsulting.com. You can also find him on LinkedIn. Uh, Zhu, uh, thanks for your time. It's been a very interesting conversation. No, likewise. And thank you so much for the invitation. And all you out there in podcast land, tune into the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. And if you're so inclined, subscribe to my Substack, robertbryce.substack.com. But until the next podcast, see you.